join in with me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. We gather here as the people of God, and we are the people of God even as those that cannot gather today. For we are one in the Spirit, and we are one in the, in the presence of God. We are, we are grateful that we can share today in a, in a very important and very significant day. Today we bid farewell to Debbie Barron, who has served us so faithfully and so wonderfully for so many years and the flowers you notice are in her honor today and Corey will be saying much more about her and to her later on but we certainly are have a mixture of joy at her at her new goals at her sending forth but we also have a deep sense of sadness at the loss of her active presence among us because she has blessed us in so many ways. Thank you, Debbie. After the service, we're going to have a parade. And the parade will begin on this side of the, of the building. People will gather and, and turn in to the first drive off of Wigfall. And then the parade will proceed around the building to the rear of the building and will exit out on the the drive on the, the youth building side. And if you, if you are at the conclusion of the service before the parade begins, if you got your cars, you may want to just gather in the youth parking lot. That way we can then proceed and, and it'll be less confusing and less, uh, and less traffic. So we hope that you'll plan to do that and participate. Um, and that will be uh, right after the service this morning. Please note the other announcements that are in your bulletin. There's some very important ministries that are described there, and we hope that you will participate in those and that, that you will, 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 will help us continue the, the work that, that we as a church do in this community. We want to thank Marcy for playing for us today. Mary Lou is off, and so uh, we're, we're grateful that Marcy is sharing her gifts and her talents with her this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me now as we call ourselves to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Glory in His holy name. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, You have made Your generosity known to us in so many ways. You have created us and sustained us. You have loved us with an unconditional love from which nothing can separate us. You have given us mercy when we were undeserving. You have bestowed upon us the richness of Your grace. You have redeemed us through the gift of Your only Son. You have given us Your Holy Spirit to teach us Your Word and way. And God, You walk with us step by step every day, offering us Your presence and your peace. For these and all your blessings, we praise and thank you and worship you. 
We pray now as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, all afresh on me. The scriptures remind us that God is a forgiving God, a God who invites us to come confessing our sins so that we may receive the fullness of his blessing and his, and his forgiveness. Join we now as we read, to, as we pray together the prayer that is printed in our bulletin. O oh God, have mercy upon us as we make our confession. We question your judgment when your will conflicts with our own. We are reluctant to follow the course you prescribe. We allow your call to us to be lost in the claims of the world around us. We fear the rejection of others. Grant us your grace and deliver us from self-deception. Create in us a clear vision of your way and the wisdom and the courage to follow you. In your merciful name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that the Spirit helps us in our weakness and our intercedes for us before God. Our first scripture lesson this morning is taken from Psalm 105. We'll be reading verses 4 through 11. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wonderful works He has done, His miracles and the judgments He has uttered. O offspring of His servant Abraham, children of Jacob, His chosen ones, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of His covenant forever of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Our second reading from Scripture this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, a brief passage of Scripture that tells of Jesus speaking three rather brief parables. The message this morning will be based largely upon the first two of these three parables, and the sermon this morning is a little bit more of what I would consider to be more of a teaching kind of sermon as we explore the depth of these passages a little bit more than perhaps we do on some occasions on Sunday mornings in the sermon. Today's sermon is a little bit more of a a teaching kind of sermon, at least as I can begin to gauge what that, that might mean. So with that being said, Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 50. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our Lord will stand forever. As I said, this portion of Scripture contains three brief parables, the first two of which at least seem to be remarkably similar to one another. Both the parable about the the treasure hidden in a field and the one about the pearl of great value seem, at least on the surface, to suggest an all-or-nothing approach. When we find something of deep and lasting value, we give up everything that we have in order to have it. All other things pale by comparison. There is great 
joy in our finding the treasure or the pearl, and we are to sacrifice everything for the sake of having them because all other things are of relatively small value. Of course, we also must assume that uh, the thing of great and lasting value is a thing that is holy in some way. If not, then the parable might read something like this. A man left his family and quit his job and gave up all that he had in order to chase a younger woman. I think that we can be reasonably sure that such teaching is not the intention of Jesus Christ. That is not what the kingdom of heaven is like. The object must be something holy. The kingdom of heaven is like something holy and not unholy and profane. When we look closer, we do find that there are differences between these two parables. To begin with, the fact that the man who discovers the treasure is working in the field of someone else suggests that he is a day laborer, a man probably from the working class who makes his living by the sweat of his brow. Conversely, the finder of the pearl is likely a merchant, someone from a more affluent class of citizens who barely breaks a sweat in pursuit of his living. So by extension, we may infer at least that Jesus is saying that the treasures and the pearls to be found are available to all of us regarding, uh, regardless of our socioeconomic class, of our standing in society, as it were. A second difference is that the man who discovers the treasure comes across it quite by accident. He's plowing a field and he digs up a treasure he has no way at all of knowing was hidden beneath. By contrast, the merchant seems to be in search of the pearl and he goes to great lengths in his quest to find the perfect specimen of this jewel that was prized above all other jewels in the ancient world. His discovery is the result of an intentional quest and is not completely unexpected. As before, this might lead us to make some inferences about the messages of these parables. Perhaps, perhaps Jesus is trying to say that some people discover the riches of the kingdom of heaven quite by accident, while others make such discoveries only after embarking upon some quest, some pilgrimage for spiritual truth. There seems to be some validity to all of this, as I think most of us can think of examples of both those kinds of things. Some of us simply stumble upon God's truth. It kind of happens to us. And some of us find it only after we have studied and prayed and devoted untold spiritual energy in order to find it. So there are differences between the two, but in reality, they both seem to be leading to a similar conclusion. The kingdom of heaven is like a thing of great value that someone discovers and rejoices over, so much so that he or she is willing to sacrifice most everything in order to have it. It's something of an all or nothing proposition. And this is an important gospel message for all of us to hear. This morning, I, I want to invite you to dig even a little bit deeper with me and to see if that is all that these parables might have to say to us. Parables are sometimes trickier than they seem to be on the surface level. They often hide as much from us as they reveal, and they often have more than just one simple meaning or sim one simple point that they're trying to make. They make use of metaphor and simile, but they don't always give us an exact comparison. Though the kingdom of heaven may be like treasures, it may be like pearls, it may not be just like treasures or pearls. So I invite you for just a few minutes to, to pick up your shovel and with me to dig just a little bit deeper. To begin with, it is important to note that treasure stories were common in ancient times and have persisted even into our time. We all know stories about pirates searching for buried treasure and treasure maps where an ex marks the spot of unseen riches and glory. If you've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, you've seen those kinds of things before. Our own Christian tradition contains the stories of crusaders setting off for, uh, from Europe for the Middle East in search of the Holy Grail and other ancient relics from the time of Jesus Christ. So treasure stories are not new to us. 
In the ancient world and even in somewhat recent history, burying treasures was the very best way to protect them from others. Back in ancient times, of course, you didn't just drive over to the local bank and place things in a safety deposit box. Those kinds of things were non-existent until fairly recent history. The rabbis of Jesus' time had a saying. They said that there is only one safe repository for money, and that is the earth. Because ancient Palestine had seen so many battles, and had been occupied by so many foreign armies coming through to plunder whatever they could lay their hands on. It was common practice for the people in ancient Palestine to hide their things in the ground when armies approached. Sometimes those who did the hiding were killed and made captives and hauled off to distant lands never to return, and the treasures that they had hidden would be unearthed many years later by someone else who had no idea that they were even there. The Dead Sea Scrolls, if you know anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's a really good example of this particular phenomenon. Even today, we see folks with metal detectors combing beaches and battlefields and all sorts of places hoping to find something that has been left beneath the surface of the earth. Archaeologists regularly engage in the practice of excavating ancient ruins, and they occasionally will find whole villages beneath the surface of the land that had been lost to the sands of time. So Jesus' parable described a situation that was a real situation to His disciples. But notice again the words of the brief parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in His joy He goes and sells all that He has and buys the field. There is a hidden treasure. Someone finds it and then hides it again. Hides it from whom, we might ask? Then in his joy, he sells all that he has, not some of what he has, not most of what he has, but all that he has. With the proceeds, he buys the field in which he discovered the treasure. It's not until that very last line that we are made aware that the finder of the treasure is not the owner of the field. Our modern minds may wonder why he did what he did when he purchased the field. We grew up as children, many of us, saying finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? And we largely operate under that precept as adults. If I find a quarter laying in the parking lot somewhere, I don't go trying to find out whose quarter it is. I put it in my pocket and Go about my business probably, right? Man with a a metal detector who finds artifact from the Civil War on the battlefield doesn't then run off to make an offer on purchasing the battlefield. He puts the artifact in his pocket. Or if he is benevolent, he donates it maybe to a museum. Maybe the battlefield has a museum and he gives it to the curator. So why does this finder of the treasure that is hidden in a field, go off to purchase the field, especially when it cost him everything that he owns? It's a good question. Here's where we find that Jesus' disciples knew something that most of us don't know. In the ancient Jewish world, there were religious codes of morality that were at work. It wasn't so simple as finders, keepers, losers, weepers. The laws regarding what those who make discoveries can keep and what they cannot keep were fairly complicated, but in a nutshell, this was the standard. If it is reasonable to expect that the treasure found is owned by someone else, the treasure does not belong to the finder. Rather, it belongs to the person who owns the property upon which the treasure was discovered. If the treasure exists with no way at all possible of determining its ownership, then, and only then, the finder gets to keep it. So the fact that the finder in the parable goes off to purchase the land at ultimate expense, everything he owns, indicates that he believes that the treasure is not his to claim. As parable scholar John Dominic Crossan puts it, he said, if the treasure belongs rightfully to the finder, buying the land is unnecessary. But if the treasure does not belong to the finder, buying the land is unjust. 
there's not been a full disclosure made. So if he believes that he must make public his discovery of the hidden treasure to the landowner before making an offer on the land, and this is seemingly what he does believe, then he is acting immorally by purchasing the land without making that full disclosure of the treasure that he has found and then hidden again. But this leaves him, you see, in a pickle. If he buys the land and then starts spending money around town from the discovery that uh, of his treasure that he's made, then everyone in the town will know that he's up to something and that he can be called forth for violating the law by the rabbis and the local magistrates. We must remember that religious and legal standards back in Jesus' time were one and the same thing. To act immorally was more or less the same as acting illegally. So he has all of this newfound wealth that he cannot spend lest he blow his cover for swindling the landowner out of the treasure that was rightfully the landowner's to begin with. I hope you're following all this. It's complicated, I know. Some scholars speculate that this parable would have actually made the disciples howl with laughter at the picture of a man whose greed has gotten the best of him. He had spent all of his money to purchase a treasure that he couldn't use. Such an observation may take us to a different understanding of the parable. If the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, the question begged is whether or not we can ever possess the kingdom. I know we talk an awful lot in our faith and Christianity about the purchase of salvation, about the abundance of riches, about our inheritance in Christ. We even talk about our eternal reward in heaven. Yet in the end, we cannot claim the kingdom of heaven as a possession. It is one thing to live under God's reign in God's kingdom, but it's quite another thing to say that the kingdom is ours as if it were something under our control. It never is. It seems to me that our treasure as those who follow Christ is more akin to a type of wisdom by which we live than it is a thing that we possess. It is a wisdom given by God and received by grace. Hear these words from the 8th chapter of Proverbs. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Wisdom. Real treasure, then, is a gift that we cannot possess and can receive only by the grace of God. It is unexpected like the treasure hidden in a field discovered with great joy, but if we try to possess it, the folly is ours. The joke is on us. This, it seems to me, is the thing, at least one of the things, that Jesus wants to teach us in this parable. There may also be a similar level of folly in the approach of the pearl merchant. We know the quest was made with eyes wide open that he expected one day to discover a pearl of great value. In the ancient world, pearls were considered the finest of all fine jewels. Diamonds at this point in history were still so rare as to be almost unknown in Jesus' world. So pearls were the thing to be prized above all jewels that were widely known. So the merchant finally comes across the object of his quest. It's just one single pearl of great value, but it's worth everything to him. So he goes and sells everything he has, which may well have been a considerable amount. And with the proceeds, he buys the pearl that he covets. His quest is fulfilled, and yet his future is uncertain. All that he has left in this world is the thing that he has coveted and now possesses. Yet he still has to eat. He still has to find lodging. He still has to have the basic needs for life and those necessities met. He has the pearl, but it cannot feed him. It can't provide him shelter. If he sells it, it will help him to meet these basic needs, but then he will no longer be in possession of the thing that he covets. His quest will all have been for naught. If like with the, tre the hidden treasure, we take the pearl to be symbolic of, of God's kingdom, we see once again that we cannot claim ownership of it. 
while we may admire the willingness of the merchant to sell everything else to have the thing of highest good and the kingdom of heaven is surely that it is the thing of highest good in this world we must admit that we cannot covet God's kingdom we cannot bargain our way to purchase it out from under the reign of God it is not a thing you see for us to have it is a way for us to live and there's a difference between those it's really folly for the finder of the hidden treasure to buy a treasure that he can never make use of. And it is folly for the pearl merchant to buy a pearl that cannot put food on the table. The kingdom of heaven is not meant to leave us destitute. It never is. Rather, it is meant to shower us with riches of spirit that we do not deserve and grace that we cannot possess but only receive as a gift freely given. That is the pearl that is the value of that treasure and that pearl. They enrich us not because we can claim ownership of them and put them up on our mantle and have them as a conversation piece whenever guests come over to visit. They enrich us not because they bring us private pleasure that we, can, that we never can, are able to share with anyone. Instead, they enrich us because they bring us into a closer relationship with the One who made, redeemed, and sustains us by providence and by grace. They have value because they remind us that in the end, it's not about us so much as it's about our crucified and risen Savior. He is our treasure once hidden but now revealed. He is the pearl whose value exceeds all other things of this world that we might claim to have. And yet He cannot be put on display. He cannot be controlled for our own needs and purposes. He can only be received into our hearts and given all of our thanks and praise for the new life that He has given us. This is the beginning of all the wisdom that we might ever be given. It is the only thing whose value never diminishes over the years that we live and breathe and into the eternity that awaits us in His glorious name. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Those who have ears to hear, let them listen. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Let us pray. O God of creation and redemption, we give You all praise and glory for the ways that You reach out to claim us as Your own. How grateful we are that You loved us enough to send Christ to be our Savior and that You provide for the church by the presence of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us and all around us, and especially as we gather to be the church together. Lord, we are thankful also for the gifts of family and friendship. By these gifts, we find ourselves far richer than we deserve to be. Our prayers on this morning extend to deep places of human need as we pray on behalf of families who are grieving the loss of loved ones, we pray for individuals who are missing a friend or who have found that a friendship has been lost. We pray for those who are facing uncertain futures, those dealing with a variety of health concerns, whether chronic pain or acute illness. We lift to you those making significant decisions about lifestyle or commitment those in need of revitalization, whether in body or in spirit, those confronted with seemingly impossible decisions that have to be made, those coming to terms with debilitating illness, disease, those facing transitions in life. Lord of light and wholeness, we petition You for help in our personal journeys of faith. Give us purpose in prayer and study that we may grow in our relationship with You. Make us servants of our fellow travelers in this life that we may serve Your kingdom by serving others. Have us always to be good stewards of the gifts and the resources that have been entrusted to us. 
and thereby help us to bring hope to even the darkest situations of life. Gracious God, be a source of care to youth who are facing big decisions in their lives, facing decisions about where to go to school, about colleges, those kinds of choices who are dealing with having to learn online rather than being sometimes in the presence of classmates and teachers. We pray that you would be with children, that they may continue to grow and mature in ways that are befitting your purposes. And as a new school year looms ahead, we pray that the right decisions would be made and that the right resources would be made available for our children to learn the things that they need to know. We pray for parents and for grandparents and all those who care for children. We pray for teachers dealing with a variety of new expectations related to having to teach in ways that they've never been accustomed to doing before, perhaps, and, and of having to learn things that they had never learned as they prepared to, to do that important work in our culture. We pray for community leaders and government officials that they might uh, make policies that are fitting in your sight, that they might be responsible in ways that are befitting of your kingdom. We know of such corruption, we sometimes become cynical as we Think about the things going on at, at all levels of government, from the highest to the most local, and we pray that we not become jaded about that, but that again, that you inspire those who have been elected to serve the public good, to, to do the right thing, to make decisions that are not done by self-interest, but in the interest of the commonwealth. Lord, we pray that you would be with our nation in this time of elections forthcoming that you would help us all to be open to the moving of your spirit. Lord, we pray for the, the places of great civil unrest in our land, as we know of so many places that seem to be wrought with a lot of anger and violence. We pray that you would be with those who protect us, with our police officers and firefighters, those who are in charge of emergency rescue and, and so many other important jobs in which People look after the welfare of all of us. Gracious God, all of these prayer concerns we, we lift to you and also the private meditations of our hearts, those things not spoken by me, but that reside within us. Nonetheless, help us to be your faithful servants in all those things, those treasures of your kingdom that have been entrusted to us as we pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen would invite all of you at this time who are able to please stand as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Those words are printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me again in prayer. Lord God, we pray that you would receive all of the gifts that we bring, the ways that we attempt to, to bring our treasures for the work of your kingdom. Pray that you would dedica dedicate us always to a life of service, to being able to look from within to looking outside of ourselves to the realities that others experience, to the needs of those who suffer, to the needs of those who, who need to hear a word of hope and need the ministry that only you can provide by your Spirit. Help us to be ambassadors of Christ in all that we say and do. And Lord, we lift up Debbie Barron also in our prayers and dedicate her to your service. We know that you are using her in ways that perhaps even she's not aware of at this particular time. Help her to claim, discern her call, and go with her in blessings and be with her family 
that she leaves behind, at least for this brief period of time, and bless them all to your service as we pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment, and I'm going to ask Debbie to... I have not had the pleasure of knowing Debbie as long as most of you have. She has been in the service of this church for over 20 years. She has, uh, at, the, at, the, at the present time, she occupies really two roles that are an interesting combination of jobs. Uh, I found when I came here, she is both our children's ministry uh, person, but she's also our kitchen manager. So that's, I always thought that was an interesting combination of jobs. So she is a woman, a woman of many, many gifts. Uh, if uh, many of you have uh, experienced at least one of those sides of her job, for those of you who come to Wednesday night suppers and other times in which we enjoy the fellowship of food, you have probably eaten some of the good food that she cooks. I was joking with someone recently. I've been a minister. It'll be 28 years in about two weeks uh, that I've been ordained to ministry. And I've been to a whole lot of cover dish dinners, and a whole lot of church suppers. I can tell you that over 28 years. And in all of my time in ministry, I have never eaten anything prepared at the church that had sun-dried tomatoes and artichoke hearts in it. And she makes a mean Tuscan chicken. I can tell you that. It's one of, uh, one of those favorite dishes. And I said, wow, this is incredible. Sun-dried tomatoes and artichoke hearts, really, really good. She's a wonderful cook and a hard worker and, and a very organized person. And those... She's had a good crew of people helping her for many of these dinners, and she couldn't do all of that food by herself, but she is uh, really behind all of that. And so many of us have uh, enjoyed her wonderful cooking and that really that ministry of food. And, and, and you know if you've been back in the kitchen that those of us who are enjoying the food aren't the only ones who enjoy that, that she always prepares plates and boxes that are to be taken out to other people as a form of outreach, the people that couldn't be there at that time and and people in need in our community at various times, in need of just a good meal. And so it's a real tradition here of taking food to other people. The pastoral lunch is perhaps the best example of that, but almost any time that we eat, Debbie is making plates for other people. So not just the people there are eating that good food, but, but other people as well. So we will miss that. Uh, we also know that uh, she has done wonderful work with children. Um, some of you, I know that probably insight into her children's time, uh, uh, the, the the children's church time that as the kids meet down front here in, in tip, more typical times, they have a, a small message, but then all of them leave and they go upstairs and people say, well, what happened? Where did they go? They didn't go up there just to play around. They went up there for a lesson and there's a lot of deep instruction involved in that time. And, and some of you, uh, when we were starting to film uh, these services during this fallow time between stopping worship back in mid-March and beginning it again in mid-June, you got some insight if you watched a few of those, um, those presentations that were filmed where she was upstairs in that room kind of going through what she does with our, uh, our children, has done with our children in those times. And you got a lot of insight into that, uh, that particular exercise. Debbie is an extraordinarily creative person. And that is, uh, I find, a rare quality indeed uh, these days that there aren't that many real creative people. I'm not nearly as creative as somebody like Debbie. She's amazing, the things that, that she's able to come up with. And, and so many of our children have benefited from her instruction, both on Wednesday nights and on Sunday mornings and, and at other times throughout the week and throughout the year. She has a real passion for a variety of things that we celebrate here, uh, from the fall festival to the father-daughter dance uh, to uh, the Tara Hall Christmas party that is near and dear to her heart and near and dear to the hearts of most of you. This year will be the 50th year that that event has taken place, and Debbie has been a big part of that event for many years now, and we will miss her. We'll miss her lots of times, but we're certainly going to miss her on that night. Debbie, you have done a wonderful job here, and, and she has, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, she has the last two years been taking a course going, and I didn't know this, she didn't tell me until after she graduated, completed the requirement. She's been going up to Charlotte uh, every other weekend to complete requirements, uh, course requirements 
for a degree from the Karis Bible College, and there is an option for students to come for an additional third year of residence uh, at the Karis Bible College, and so uh, she has decided that she has felt called to do that. It is in Colorado, so obviously it being in Colorado and her being in residence uh, uh, signaled a point of transition for Debbie and the call to go and pursue that particular uh, field of education, that, that course of education, and, uh, and she will be doing great things in ministry following that time of preparation, we know. Debbie, uh, the people of this church have wanted to extend to you some gestures of goodwill and, uh, and love. You know, we, couldn't, we weren't able, in a perfect world, we would have been able to keep all this a secret, but we weren't able to solicit your contributions for a love offering without her finding out about it. So she knows about this already, but the members of this church have taken up a love offering, and I have prepared... Uh, I have for you a check that has been prepared for a love offering for $8,800. <laughs> and I will present that to you. Our scholarship committee also uh, wanted to make to you a, a one-time gift that uh, is to, it's made out to you into the Karis Bible College, and so I guess you'll need to co-sign the check for $2,500 to pay for your education in the year ahead. And so we hope that these gifts... She's got a daughter getting married in October, so I know this is going to come in real handy. We know how that goes. Also, um, a member of our church, Helen Rose, has lovingly prepared for you a nice homemade loaf of bread. As you know, uh, the ancient Israelites, as they wandered in the wilderness, were hungry. And they asked God for sustenance, and God provided for them manna in the wilderness, and they ate that manna. They got kind of tired of it after a while. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but, but the bread sustained them through their journey. Uh, we also know that, uh, that Jesus Himself spoke of, of His own life and ministry as the bread of life, and I am the bread of life. Those who come to Me will never be hungry. And we know that, that you know that, but we pray that you will take this bread with you that it will be bread for your journey, that it will, at least in that you're going to have to eat it, you can't take it to Colorado, we know that, uh, but, but that in, uh, in the meantime that it will be a reminder of the ways that, that God provides for all of us and uh, in ways that are sometimes material, in ways always that are spiritual, and we pray that you will go uh, with God and with uh, a piece of Georgetown Presbyterian always in your heart. And We'll look after Bo, and we'll keep him in line while you're in Colorado. So, uh, <laughs> if we can. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but uh, that is bread for your journey, and we pray that uh, that journey be fruitful, and that it be filled with all the joy that, uh, that God can provide for you. So. Um, do you have a word to say? Do you want to say anything? First of all, just thank you. You guys have um, been such a blessing to me, and I appreciate everything. It was um, huge to be able to work here, to work with children and cook, and um, I just can't say thank you enough. You're very generous, and I love you. I'm going to miss you. Keep me in your prayers. Now may the Lord bless you, keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore.